All right. Without further ado, I'm going to get right into it. So today's program is called Irrigation Controllers and Sensors, Where Big Mistakes Happen Fast. Uh, this is part of our Water Conservation Month webinar series that we've got going on here at Pasco Extension. All right. Uh, so this is me. I'm Frank Galdo. I'm Program Coordinator for Florida Friendly Landscaping in Pasco County here. Uh, if you're not from Florida or you're not from this part of Florida, Pasco County is about halfway down the state on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and Cooperative Extension is basically bringing UF to you no matter where you're at in the state. So we've got local offices all over the state and you're able to find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, and, and find all kinds of great information online as well. Uh, so if you don't already, go ahead and follow us. That way you can hear about awesome programs that are coming up and uh, keep in touch as we're getting information out there, getting blogs out and things like that. Um, I see a few things going on in the chat. Um, hopefully everything is going all right. Um, so Jim, you got the chat under control. I'm going to keep on clicking through. And in last week's program, we covered all the outside components. So uh, in the program called Glorious Geysers and Pressure Washing Plants, we talked about all the ways that the outdoor parts of your sprinkler system, the heads, the pipes, things like that, uh, can prevent your water from getting where it's supposed to go. So if you missed that program, uh, I'd encourage you to check it out as soon as we get it posted up online um, because this gives you a lot of the things to watch and listen for to make sure that when you run the system, the water is getting where you intended it and not doing things like watering sidewalks and streets. Um, so that way, during the dry season, you know, you're, you're getting the water where it's supposed to go onto your plants. Uh, it also talked about common things like uh, when your system gets redesigned or your landscape gets redesigned, uh, you know, how to avoid issues like this where now all of a sudden uh, water is uh, not getting where it needs to go. Uh, so again, these will be posted online. I'll make it all available. Today we're going to focus entirely on these. Uh, these wonderful little contraptions, the irrigation controllers that are the brains of the system, and the sensors that can or sometimes don't uh, help you save some water and make better choices. So this is where big mistakes happen fast. And what I'm talking about is just simple mistakes uh, that are easy to overlook can quickly double, triple, quadruple, or worse uh, the amount of water you're putting out there. And a lot of times these uh, things can happen with the touch of a button and they're very hard to troubleshoot uh, if you don't know what you're looking for. So the thing is, I'm going to show you some real world examples of how some of these timer mistakes can add up to big problems. Because uh, it's not only that you're wasting water, uh, it can cause runoff and leaching of uh, fertilizer and nutrients from your landscape. Uh, it can contribute to plant diseases and fungus, huge water bills, uh, water pollution, algae blooms, all those different things. Uh, this stuff is all tied together. Uh, so it's more than just the water savings itself. Although the water savings is a really important aspect, uh, there's a lot of reasons to get this right. Um, I'm bringing a lot of these examples to you directly from outreach that I do with folks that are using more water than they should and can't really figure it out. One of the great things we've got here in Pasco County is a really good partnership with Pasco County Utilities where we actually are able to provide some outreach and assistance to help troubleshoot those issues where you know somebody is certain that their sprinklers are running 15 minutes a zone once a week and somehow they're using 80,000 gallons a month of water. And so I'm going to kind of guide you through some of how that happens. Uh, and uh, just hang on tight. It's a wild ride. All right. So for those that attended last week's program, I'm going to follow a similar format. I'm basically going to give you some examples of a problem, a few key tips for how to recognize it, what it might look like or sound like, uh, and some possible fixes or solutions uh, to help you prevent this or correct it. All right, so before we do that, I want to throw out a real quick poll for everybody uh, and just kind of gauge where you're at on things. Um, so here's a quick question is, if your sprinkler system has three zones, how many start times will you typically need in order to run those three zones? So go ahead and uh, give your answer on here. If you don't know, that's fine. There's a not sure option. Um, so 
You've got three zones in your system. You want all three zones to run. How many start times do you need to make it happen? So go ahead, throw some answers down real quick. And uh, you know, once I've got most of the folks voting here, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the polling. All right. So end polling. And so you can see we've got a, a bit of a split on the answers there. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look. The answer is on a typical controller, you're going to need one start time to run all the scheduled zones. Uh, this is a big mistake warning for you. Uh, now, some exceptions apply. I'll get into that, but here's what we're talking about. Problem is multiple start times is a really easy mistake to make, really hard to catch and easy to overlook, uh, and it wastes a lot of water when it happens. Uh, and sometimes this stuff gets really complicated and messy. Uh, this is a, a graph of actual water meter data, and each of those blue spikes is basically a watering cycle. And you can see this person was entirely sure they were running the thing once a week, 15 minutes zone, very efficiently, and it turns out they've got all sorts of different things. This uh, program was running you know, more often than not. So let's take a look at how it happens. Think of a start time like an alarm clock for your controller. So it's telling it when to wake up and when to turn on the program and start running. Now, typically it takes one start time to run the entire program of all the zones that have a runtime in them. Um, so what I'm talking about is if you've got a 4 a.m. start time, it's going to turn on, it's going to run zone one, and then it's going to run zone two, it's going to run zone three in sequence, in consecutive order. Uh, so that one start time runs the whole show. Now, most controllers, though, allow you to set up multiple start times. This lets you run repeated watering cycles. So if instead you were to put in three start times for your three zones, thinking that each zone needs its own start time, here's what's actually going to happen. At 4 a.m., the thing turns on. It runs through all three zones, and then it runs again, and it runs again. So now, all of a sudden, you've tripled your watering time. Now, there's a reason that controllers allow you to do this, but not a lot of people really know about it, and not a lot of people use it the right way. Um, the issue is, let's say your yard has some hilly areas and uh, your soil tends to repel water. You know, sometimes we've got that hydrophobic sand where just the surface will get wet and then the water runs off. Maybe you got a lot of clay. Well, what it would do is you're going to go ahead and um, get that window going on. Hey, Jim, are you able to uh, do anything with the folks that are coming in? Because I think that's why that box just popped up. Okay. We'll see if that box goes away. Otherwise, I'll pause for a second. Um, all right. Now, the reason is if you've got a situation like this and you run one long uh, uh, run time, you're going to lose a lot of water to run off. I'm going to... Pause the share for just a second, and then we share to try to get rid of that box. All right. All right. So yeah, you'll wind up with a situation like this, where a lot of your water is running right off and not getting down to the root zone. So what multiple start times allows you to do is you could add brief run times, really brief, in what's called a cycle and soak method. And so let's say you actually would break this into three cycles of really, really short watering cycles, maybe six minutes per pop-up zone and 14 minutes for rotors. So this is way shorter than you would normally run them for, but you're running it three times as opposed to just once. And that lets the water soak in between each cycle. Now, the problem is um, if you don't understand that this is what's intended with that multiple start time, uh, setup, 
and you run that 20 minute full cycle, then you're basically tripling that and running the whole thing um, for 60 minutes, which instead of putting down three quarters of an, uh, three quarters of an inch of water, you've now put down a full two and a quarter inch of water overnight, which is not what you were trying to do. Uh, that's way more water than your landscape needs, way more than it might even be able to absorb in some areas. Uh, now, let's say you were running it twice a week. That's four and a half inches a week uh, and 18 inches per month at that rate. Uh, so that's a huge amount of water. And, you know, just picture, meanwhile, you and the neighbor are sitting here wondering why this area between the houses is always so soggy uh, and why your water bill is always triple what his is. Uh, so true story, actually a few years back, I was helping to troubleshoot one. There was so much water being put onto the landscape that the neighbor across the street was having water come up in his yard through the utility condu uh, conduits that run under the road. Uh, so literally there was basically a spring developing from one yard to another uh, because of multiple start times running the thing way more than somebody thought it was. All right. So what's this going to look like on the clock and how do you get rid of it? Uh, each clock's a little bit different, but the process tends to be pretty similar. So here's a couple different examples. Uh, you know, this one over here on the left, you've got three different start times that you can program in. This one and this one, you've got one slot on the clock. Uh, this is kind of a common setup now, so I'm going to focus on one of these in the next slide and show you a little bit. All right. So in a setup like this, let's say you want to check your start times and maybe remove some. So you're going to point that dial over at start times and using the minus button, typically the way to remove a start time is going to be hit minus uh, or something along those lines until you bring it all the way to midnight and then go one notch past that and it's going to turn off. All right. Now let's say you want to check and make sure you don't have a second start time or a third or a fourth. You're going to have to go over to the next one using, uh, in this controller, that little arrow to the right. And you're going to see, hey, there's a second start time here. Second start time was set up for 4 o'clock. We want to go ahead and do the same exact process. You're going to use that little minus, take it to midnight, take it one notch back, and that'll turn it off. Um, you want to do that to eliminate all the unnecessary start times uh, until you get down to just the one that you need. Now, if you're unsure about the process for your specific controller, uh, you know, there's some great tutorials online. You can try searching uh, and see what pops up or feel free to contact me. I can point you in the right direction. I have some great uh, tutorials saved that I like to refer folks to. Um, I'm even able to just, you know, hold up the phone and guide you through a little bit. Um, now, this is such a common issue. Uh, that manufacturers have taken all sorts of different approaches to try to prevent people from doing it. So this is on one of the newer controllers. They literally warn you before you put a new start time in, are you sure you want to do that? Because each of these start times is going to run all your zones. Uh, other controllers, uh, this is why I said some exceptions apply. There's at least one or two on the market that have just given up on people and literally do a whole different interface uh, just to make things a little confusing. But in any case, most controllers, it's going to be one start time to run the whole show. All right. So similar problem that I'm going to get into. Uh, the next one is multiple programs. So similar to the last problem, uh, this one can double, triple, quadruple your water real quick. And when you combine the two, you can get some amazingly high usage. Uh, and these things hide in plain sight. All right. So multiple programs. Uh, a program is basically a watering schedule. So most modern controllers give you the option to set up uh, two, sometimes three, four, or more. So you get sometimes A or B. You might have uh, A, B, or C on some of these. Uh, some of them you get A, B, C, D. Um, there is a reason why, just like with multiple programs, but a lot of people don't uh, understand it. And if you misinterpret this, it can be big trouble. All right, so let's talk about the why. Let's say you've got a three program system. You might set up one program for your once a week watering that's allowed just for standard landscape irrigation. So you've got that running on your watering day. Now, what you could do is, let's say you had to resod one of your zones. Let's say there was some utility work that dug up the whole front yard and you had to redo that sod there. 
Program mm -hmm. B can be set up with an entirely independent watering cycle that runs completely separately from program A with whatever frequency you need to get that new turf established. Now, program C, you might set that up for your micro irrigation on your shrubs and uh, your landscape beds, or maybe even some vegetable gardens that you've got going in the backyard. You can set up three entirely different watering schedules, you know, once a week, every day, every three days. Uh, and that's what the multiple programs allows you to do there. Now let's say you went ahead and you wanted to turn off that sod zone. It's fully established. You just want to move that back over onto zone or on a program A. So it's all running once a week. Well, if you do that, um, this allows you to do that and still keep A and C active. Now, if that's what you intended to do, that's great. But if what you really intended to do was turn off your entire system, and you saw off up there on the screen because you turned off program B and you thought you turned off all your water. Let's say it's the rainy season, you're leaving town for a little while, uh, you wanted to completely turn the system off, you did not do that. You've still got two different programs going. Uh, so the trick is you have to kind of understand how this all works. Um, all three programs are active programs uh, if you've got all the elements they need in there. All right, so let's talk about that. To be an active program, it needs three parts. Without any one of these three components, uh, the program drops off and no longer is active. So each program that's active needs to have a frequency in there of how often it's going to run. So this may be a watering day that's programmed in. It may be, you know, odd or even every other day, something like that. Uh, it could be any number of different uh, frequencies that you set up in there. It's going to need a start time that tells it when to run. And it's going to need run times telling your zone or zones how long to run. So if it's got a frequency in there and it's got a start time, but there's no zone set up with a run time, uh, it's not an active program. You can remove any of these and it, it pulls it out of the mix. Now, to be on the safe side, personally, I like to remove all the components if I'm not using a program. And that way I don't accidentally uh, just have one button to push to kick in my whole sod watering schedule all over again. So I would prefer to have to really mean it to go ahead and add a new program in there. Um, all right, so of those three elements that I just mentioned, uh, the frequency, the run times and the start times. Uh, the one that I really haven't covered yet uh, at all is frequency, how often the program runs. Uh, so most of the time, due to watering restrictions, we're going to be using a custom day of the week schedule option. So, you know, here in Pasco County, we've got different watering schedules allowed for potable water versus reclaimed and wells and surface water. Um, each of these has their own uh, system of day of the week corresponding to your number of your address. Uh, throughout Florida, this is pretty common, pretty standard. Uh, there's ways to find out what your watering days are and then make sure that your uh, controller is matching that. Now, an important caveat of making sure your controller is matching that is your controller needs the date and time set correctly. So it's one of those things you don't really think about why does the sprinkler need to know what day and time it is. I, so you're not watering on Tuesday uh, instead of Monday, uh, that's your day. Now, where this can get you in trouble with the frequency is that sometimes on some of these controllers, it's easy to accidentally select one of the other setups, like odd even or interval watering. Uh, and with those options, things can get out of hand real fast. I'm gonna give you an example. All right, so there's one common controller that's out there on the market right now uh, in a lot of new homes and it's got an interface that looks like this so you can set up your day of the week watering here now right now it's set up for every day of the week and if i was going in here i might want to go and remove all those days now that my sod's established or my landscape plants are established i'm going to use the arrow buttons there to navigate around this so pressing the minus button i can knock a day right out of the lineup uh, so i'll go over to the next one 
and I'll take the next time out and so on. I'll just pull all those days out. Now, with this particular clock, the tricky part is if I press that over to the right button one more time, I take this thing over to an interval watering schedule. And it's really easy to stumble onto this screen and it looks very similar except for that little calendar. Now, interval watering on this clock, that calendar and that little number up there basically means I've now got it on a daily watering schedule. So somebody popped in. I'm going to stop the share for just a second to get rid of that little orange box. Why that keeps popping up. Technical Ford will figure out with this. All right. So interval watering, this box now means I'm on a daily watering cycle. And if I was to select or unselect any of these days, that's basically choosing which days I do or don't want to be included in that daily cycle. So let's say I always wanted to mow on Saturday. I could deselect Saturday out of that mix. Um, but you can see how easy it would be to accidentally uh, stumble onto this. And now instead of watering one day a week, I am watering you know, six or seven days a week. Uh, so know your controllers, know your uh, displays and things like that, uh, especially if you got really high unusual water bills. Um, some of these things can hide in plain sight. All right. So next problem I'm going to talk about here, uh, some things that can happen in the controllers like power loss, backup batteries, power surges. Um, some of these things can have pretty big impacts. And being here in Florida, you know, our controllers are subject to a lot of weirdness uh, between lightning storms, power surges, hurricanes. Uh, you know, we lost power for Irma for about a week. Um, a lot of clocks are equipped with backup batteries. Those backup batteries are usually there to preserve the date and time and sometimes the programming but extended power loss can actually sometimes exceed the capacity of the battery. Uh, so we did see this some after Irma, that after a week, uh, even your backup battery on this thing is giving up the ghost. Uh, so anytime you've got a little power blip, uh, you know, some of these happen really quickly, uh, especially in the summertime, it's worth double checking this before you run the thing because in a lot of cases, the default on the clock is to turn back on and run it every day for 10 minutes a zone, which is probably not what you're intending to do, especially during the rainy season. But sometimes that's literally what it will reactivate with. Um, so something to keep in mind. Now, another interesting thing is, uh, you know, I call this maybe a Friday afternoon, almost happy hour mistake, or maybe a newbie mistake. In order to activate the backup battery on some of these newer clocks where they've got the lithium battery, uh, you notice what they didn't pull out right there. Uh, that little plastic tab is what insulates the contacts on the battery. If you don't pull that out when you install the clock, your backup battery is not a backup battery. It is uh, basically not there as far as the clock's concerned. So in some cases, I've gone out and literally the controller is losing programming every single time there's a power surge on a brand new controller. And uh, you've got an issue like this. Um, somebody just forgot to dot their I's and cross their T's. All right, so along the same lines, I'll occasionally meet somebody that is very proudly telling me that they unplug the controller whenever it's not in use. And, you know, while the sentiment is good and, you know, I understand maybe even some of the goals, you know, trying to protect it from power surges and things like that, um, typically there's not really a great reason to do that and you're just going to be putting stress on that backup battery and probably running it down. Um, so the thing is, um, if you're trying to get it to not get toasted by a lightning strike or a power surge, the thing to keep in mind is you might disconnect your 24 volt AC from the wall, but especially in the case of a lightning strike, all these wires here are running to zones that are buried in the wet ground right outside your house. So this thing can take a hit uh, regardless of whether it's plugged in because you've got a bunch of heavy gauge copper wires connected directly into the ground. So probably better to just go ahead and leave it plugged in, leave the backup battery um, you know, charged up and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, sometimes these things will get toasted, but plug it into a surge protector and you know, hope for the best.
Um, all right, so along those same lines, next problem I'm going to talk about is the fact that controllers don't last forever. Um, these things are mounted often in a garage or outside on the wall, uh, not very climate controlled. They do get power surges and lightning strikes and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's circuitry in there. Eventually, after years and years of fiddling with the knobs, uh, stuff just wears out. Some of these older controllers that are on the wall, you know, I've seen some that still have the sticker that says Y2K compliant. Uh, that thing's been on the wall for a long time. And they start to act quirky. So sometimes the display starts to lag or flicker or jump. You notice that this one is pointing at Friday, but it's showing me Monday. If I wiggle the controller a little bit, you know, it'll flash and flicker and sometimes it'll jump to Saturday or Friday or this or that. If it's doing this, this is a really good sign that you can't trust this thing because you don't know what's going on on the inside. It's certainly not matching up with what's showing you on the screen. And the thing to remember about this is eventually as these start to get erratic and unreliable, they can be watering too much, too little. I've seen them watering two zones at once. Um, all sorts of wackiness. And it's much cheaper to replace a controller than to replace your landscape. So this thing has a lot of responsibility. You want to make sure it's doing what it's doing and you can trust it. Uh, you know, you've gotten your year's worth out of one like this. Go ahead and let it retire. And you know, when you're disposing it, take it to the e-waste disposal so that all the parts and pieces wind up where they're supposed to go. Uh, but yeah, you can see this one is nicely toasted here along the edge. Uh, it's got a little bit of singeing on the circuit board. Um, it's time to get a new one. All right. So moving right along here, um, the next problem that I'm going to talk about uh, steps outside for a minute. Gets a little breath of fresh air. I'm going to talk about rain sensors. These are part of the whole controller interface system, so that's why I'm bringing them into this presentation as opposed to the last one. Um, now you might be wondering how rain sensors can be a problem. And here's the thing. In Florida, we get a lot of rain at certain times of year. So, for example, in the summertime, we're often getting daily downpours in the occasional tropical system. In the wintertime, we're getting those cold fronts moving through and often getting more than enough rain uh, in a lot of years for the wintertime landscape when stuff is half Um Now, because of that, you know, sometimes we do not need the sprinklers to run. You know, you got situations like this where we may have gotten eight inches of rain in the last week. Now, if we were all manually watering and dragging around hose end sprinklers, we wouldn't be doing that when uh, this is going on. Uh, we wouldn't be out there dragging this stuff out there, all that kind of stuff. But in the middle of the summer, regardless of how much rain we get, you guys all all seen something like this. You got the sprinklers rising up like a periscope out of the abyss and it's watering in the middle of you know a tropical storm. And it's just because Wednesday is the watering day, that's what's in the controller. Uh, and that's what the rain sensors were designed to reduce or eliminate, but there's some issues. All right, so here's the thing. Since the 90s, Every professionally installed controller is supposed to be equipped with some sort of rain sensor. So if they're present, they're usually going to be mounted uh, like up on a roof or sometimes on a post. The basic idea of how these work is if the sensor is wet, it prevents the system from running. So even if there's a program that's supposed to run, it's all scheduled, uh, it, it hits this and the signal gets squashed. Once this sensor dries out, it allows the system to resume its regularly scheduled watering programs. So they can save a bit of water. UF research has verified that, uh, you know, they will sometimes prevent an irrigation cycle or two from running, but they're not always all they're cracked up to be. And here's what I mean. Here's some of the reasons why these things uh, fail to save the water that you think they probably are. Uh, sometimes, the shrubs have grown over it. You know, it's mounted on a post, and uh, at this point, that sweet viburnum is 20 years old, and it's 20 feet tall, and that sensor is getting no rainfall signals whatsoever. Uh, maybe a springboard squirrel, you know, uh, fantastic leap has knocked the thing down. Uh, 
Uh, you've got some situation where you got new gutters, the wire didn't reach, now it's just dangling there under the overhang, it didn't get remounted. Uh, you know, some of these things after a few years, they're certified wildlife habitat. You know, Florida Permanent Landscaping is all about creating wildlife habitat and all that, uh, but not with your rain sensor. This is just an irrigation fail if it's covered in spider webs and air plants and things like that. Um, you know, similarly, a lot of the ones out there on the market right now are wireless devices. Um, wireless devices are great, but there's a battery in there. That battery is only going to last so long. Uh, eventually, it's going to stop communicating with the base that's wired to the controller. And at that point, you've just got a fancy gutter decoration. All right. So some of these, you can actually get up there and change the battery. Other ones, it's literally made to toss it and uh, buy a new one. Uh, but after a couple of years, chances are it's probably not doing much. Um, also, these things have to be switched on. A lot of times these sensors are turned off when the landscape is first getting established. It's switched to bypass. And unless you know to turn it on, it may be just sitting there bypassed and be a fancy gutter decoration again. Uh, so if it's not active, it's switched on, your controller ignores the fact that it's there and you might be one of those people watering in the middle of a tropical storm and you don't even realize it. Um, now, even when these are brand new and all that other stuff is done right, recent UF research has actually found that the dry out time on these is typically very different than the soil, meaning that they're often ready to allow watering in just a day or two, even if the ground and the roots of the plants are still plenty happy and saturated. So even at their best, uh, these are going to save some water, but not necessarily as much as uh, you could with some other tools. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. There's really good technology out there that's coming out. Uh, it's pretty uh, good at taking the guesswork out. Um, there's two main things that we're going to talk about. And uh, actually, there's a great rebate program that's just kicking off soon. Uh, that's going to allow folks to do some retrofits with some of this. So this is something worth paying attention to and sharing with folks. Uh, first, uh, smart irrigation technology I'm going to talk about is soil moisture sensors. So this actually is a probe that goes in the ground right down there at root level and it's measuring the moisture in the ground before the system runs. So if there's enough moisture in the ground where the probe is buried, it's going to tell the system, skip the watering, it's not needed. So it actually allows your system to decide if it needs to run or not. Pretty awesome. So there's a little console that goes up next to the clock, and this thing is going to have a real-time measurement of how wet or dry the ground is. Uh, and it's going to feed into the controller and tell it whether or not to run. So see, so keep the thing from running, say, you know, skip it, wait till the next one. The other kind of smart irrigation technology that's out there right now that's got a lot of promise uh, and saving some uh, good amounts of water when it's done right is an ET uh, evapor evapotranspiration or ET weather-based controller. Basically what that means is it's a fancy way of saying it takes the weather into account and does some predicting of whether or not your sprinklers need to run. So there's all different ways that it does this. A lot of times what's neat about these is they're also uh, able to feed uh, some of that control into your smartphone or into the smartphone of your irrigation controller, um, your irrigation contractor. And so you're able to monitor this remotely. You know, let's say you're sitting up there in upstate New York and you don't want your sprinklers to run in the middle of the summer. You can check and make sure that the ET controller's got it under control and is monitoring all that and, and so on. So there's a lot of promise with this, but as with anything where you're depending on technology, uh, the devil's in the details. So you don't want the soil probe, for instance, in the shadiest, wettest part of the yard. Uh, a lot of times you've got your valve box sitting right there along the side of the house. Uh, it's probably next to the downspout, the air conditioner drip, all that, sitting in the shade. That's a terrible place to put your soil moisture sensor. So you got to run enough wire or have a wireless one that allows you to put it out in an open, sunny spot in the yard. Uh, the driest spot in the yard is the ideal place for it. Um, there's also considerations with different models of how close they have to be to the controller, uh, which zone they're in. You know, some of them want to be in the last zone so they don't kick off your watering cycle halfway through or anything like that. So. A lot of the details on this are really crucial to get right. Location, calibration, setup. 
So if you're going with something like this, make sure it's being installed by somebody who is really familiar with the devices or really good at installing stuff by reading the directions. Don't go with that guy who tears it out of the box and you know ignores all that and just you know, wires it up. A lot of important stuff to get right to make the savings work. Um, so another issue that you can get is I've seen some situations where somebody already had the rain sensor and they wanted to combine it with the soil moisture sensor. Now, there's not a whole lot of good reason to do that, but you might be able to save a few extra drops of water, but you have to do it right. Uh, and this is a really, really uh, wild sort of one. If you do it wrong and you wire them incorrectly, uh, it practically cancels out. Rather than giving you the benefits of two sensors, it pretty much gives you the worst of both. So whichever one dries out first is going to let your system run. And we saw that in a new community where they were getting installed with both of these on brand new homes and they were saving almost no water. Uh, it took some real troubleshooting to try to figure this one out. Uh, so again, if you're doing something with new technology, make sure you're understanding that technology and doing it right. Um, you know, the manufacturers want to see this stuff work, so reach out to them if you're not sure. Reach out to us here at Extension. We've been on the ground helping folks figure this stuff out, and, um, you know, we've seen some stuff. All right, similarly with the ET controllers, there's caveats to them. For instance, some of those ET controllers are pulling weather data from the nearest, um, you know, weather underground stations or NOAA stations or airport stations. Depending where you live versus where that weather data is coming from, it may or may not match. Here in Florida, we get some really patchy, spotty kind of stuff. Um, you know, that, that last picture was showing some uh, rainstorms where there was an inch, inch and a half of rain that fell in uh, South Pinellas. And if you live up there, you know, somewhere off in Hillsborough, and you're getting weather data from down there or vice versa, your ET controller is only going to do so well for keeping your landscape healthy. Um, so on-site data is really the best thing to do with an ET controller. Uh, likewise, you know, if they're pulling from weather underground, you want to make sure that you're able to maybe choose which uh, weather stations is pulling from. You don't want to get in temperature data from Jimmy's weather station where he carefully mounted it above his chimney and now it's a chilly night uh, you know, in the 40s and he's got his fireplace going and it's 140 degrees at Jimmy's house. Uh, probably not going to give you the best sort of um, accuracy in your weather-based controller. So understand how it works. You can save a lot of water. Um, get it wrong and things get interesting. All right. So the thing about some of those last things that I showed that's great is they help take some of the guesswork out of watering. So, um, you know, it's great to know how to work your system and all that, um, but in some cases, if you like to set it and forget it, uh, you can take some of the guesswork out even more by using some of those newer smart irrigation technologies. And that's really what Florida Friendly Landscaping is all about trying to encourage is taking out some of the guesswork, using some science and knowledge. And when you've got less guesswork, you get less problems in the landscape. And when you've got less uh, problems, you've got better landscapes uh, that are resilient and they're not constantly under stress and being drenched in irrigation and fertilizer and pesticides and things like that. So that's really what uh, this whole program is all about. Uh, today, we really just focused very narrow on the water efficiency in the controller side of it, but it's a much bigger picture sort of thing than that. And uh, what's great is when you really start to put all the pieces together, uh, you get these great landscapes that don't need all those inputs and don't come with all the, um, the negative consequences when you're uh, constantly spraying all that stuff all over the place. Uh, so you can start to support a wider diversity of wildlife. Uh, you can help save our uh, water and things like that. Uh, all that's really important because right now Florida's population is growing really rapidly. So if it's going to continue to grow like this, we need to be sure we're doing things right. We're understanding uh, how we're watering, why we're watering, what we're planting, and all those different elements. Um, you know, that's where we really uh, would love to be able to give you the assistance and the information that you need. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is all about bringing that expertise of UF to you. So you can achieve whatever your landscape goals are out there without all that guesswork 
uh, and the unintended consequences. So the good news is you really don't have to be an expert in any of this. You've got us available 24 seven. You got your master gardeners all across the state. Uh, we're here to help and uh, you know, ready to answer your questions. So before I go on any further, I'm gonna go ahead and speaking of questions, I'm gonna send you guys a question. So first question that I wanna know is, do you have an irrigation system? So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that poll real quick. Go ahead and, and if you could answer that, uh, and pop your answers into the box. Uh, we'll go ahead and check that out here in a second. Now, I'm also going to open things up here in a second to questions in the chat and try to get to anything that might have come in. Uh, and if you've got anything that you would like to learn about in upcoming programs, uh, you know, we've already got some on the books scheduled for uh, later this month. Uh, and we are always looking for some feedback of what's interesting to you. So is it some plant selection? Are you interested in right plant, right place, attracting wildlife? Maybe you want to know a little bit more about managing pests responsibly. Uh, and some of the cool critters that are able to help you uh, manage your pests without you being hands-on uh, and doing all that. You know, we've got hoverflies, we've got breakinid wasps, we've got ladybugs, all sorts of cool critters that, that can be helping you out uh, when you spray a little bit less and leave it a little bit more in, uh, in the hands of the critters you're attracting. So go ahead and I'm gonna finish up this poll real quick. Let you guys type some stuff in the chat. I see some stuff coming in. I'm going to end this polling, and it looks like, all right, most of you guys do have an irrigation system. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to use some of what you learned today. And with that, I'm actually going to jump into another question while you guys are typing in questions in the chat and things like that. Uh, if you don't mind filling out a quick before and after uh, knowledge survey. Uh, basically, I want to see how you would rate your knowledge of today's topic before today's webinar from uh, one being lowest to 10 being the highest. And then how would you rate today's uh, knowledge that you've got after the webinar, uh, one being lowest, 10 being highest. And hopefully everybody gained a little bit of knowledge and I didn't knock anything out of your brain uh, or just kind of baffle you. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that one. And if you don't mind filling that out and just let me know, uh, you know, if you guys learned a little bit of something. And then I'm going to go ahead and check this chat box real quick. Okay. So I see one question here uh, that says, what are the cost estimates for a soil probe uh, for a soil moisture sensor in a community situation, 20 houses on one system? All right, so I don't exactly know uh, the uh, details of your system, which makes it a little bit tricky. If you've literally got one controller running all 20 homes, um, you know, you may, in some of those larger controllers, actually be able to use multiple probes uh, at strategic places throughout the community, in which case um, you're probably going to need to figure out how many probes you would need um, and how it all interfaces with the system you've got. So that would probably be something to um, check with your irrigation uh, contractor that you work with for the community. And also, there are grants out there right now. There's a couple of different things going on. Uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District has one called WISE Funding, W-I-S-E. Um, the WISE Funding Program is specifically for helping communities do this sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's a way to fund water conservation programs to groups that weren't traditionally uh, eligible for Southwest Florida Water Management District funding. So South, Southwest Florida Water Management District is what we have here in 
uh, this part of the state. If you're elsewhere in the state, you may need to check your own water management district, uh, but the abbreviation SWFWMD, sometimes uh, people call them SWIFMUD. The WISE program, um, Josh, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name right now. I'm gonna kick myself later. Um, but Josh over there at SWIFMUD is the contact for the WISE program. And that's gonna be a great thing to look into. The other thing to look into is gonna be from Tampa Bay Water. They're kicking off some rebate programs as well. So uh, see what you can do on that to help offset that cost of the soil moisture sensors. And typically the water savings are gonna pay off whatever the costs are up front in a relatively short amount of time in a lot of situations. Not every situation. Uh, I don't necessarily want to come up with a quote on the spot. Um, the caveat that I would say for a multi-house system is you've got to have either enough probes and enough ability to segment the community that you can deal with different water conditions and different soil conditions, or you need to kind of go lowest common denominator and base it on the driest parts of the community, which in some cases might still leave certain areas getting overwatered, but you're probably still gonna do all right um, and save some water. So there's, there's gonna be um, less, uh, specific situations going on. You can always contact us or um, have your irrigation folks contact us. And you know, it's something that I have helped communities try to figure out before. So hope that wasn't too lengthy of a question and of an answer to your question and uh, helped clear it up a little bit. Excellent. All right. Well, glad that cleared it up and helped you a little bit. Um, definitely look into some of those funding uh, opportunities. And if you want to send me an email after the program, you can go ahead and do that. And I'll, I will um, get you those links out there. All right. So it looks like most of you guys have voted here in the poll. And it's good to see that many of you look, uh, look to have gained some knowledge. Excellent. Uh, very cool. All right. Well, I'm glad to see that. And let's see. Um, that being said, let's see if I had anything else in the slideshow right here. Um, just a quick disclaimer before we wrap up, any mention or images of specific brands or products was for education purposes. It doesn't imply endorsement or a lack of endorsement by IFAS or Pasco County. Uh, so, you know, I'm not uh, knocking any specific brands or pushing anything. Uh, also, it's important to note some of this stuff in the controllers involves wires and electricity and things like that. So please always be safe. Uh, you know, some of this stuff can cause problems and you gotta use precautions if working with electrical equipment or consult with a uh, licensed uh, certified professional. Uh, so, you know, be safe out there. Don't do anything that's above what you know how to do safely. Um, that being said, um, you know, I've got some contact information up here. I'd love if you guys followed us on Facebook or Twitter to stay in touch with any upcoming events we've got, uh, both with the Water Conservation Month programming that's coming up and with future programs. Uh, we've also got blog posts that I push out sometimes. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to hear from you of what would really, uh, you know, help take your landscaping to the next level and help you solve some of those problems you have out there. So um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Let us know what we can do. Hopefully we see you sometime soon. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe out there, stay healthy. Hope everybody's uh, getting a little bit done in the yard with your social distancing time. And uh, you know, make good use of it. Get out there, watch our previous webinar as soon as I get it live on the internet. You can do a wet check, um, you know, learn how to do all that. and if you use some of this stuff and some of it comes in handy, we'd love to hear it. You know, if you found out that you had six start times, let me know. I always love hearing that sort of thing uh, to know that we made some sort of impact. All right. So um, that being said, I'm going to leave up the contact information for a little bit. I'm going to check the chat box uh, a couple more times. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you guys coming out and virtually. Uh, learning a little bit with us.
and uh, 